Hello, welcome back. Today we're going to conquer the topic of how do the seasons work. Now, as children, we all have our ideas and our questions as to how do the four seasons actually happen. I'm here to tell you that most people, if you just ask a random person on the street, how do the seasons work, they're probably going to tell you it has something to do with the distance from the earth to the sun. The earth gets uh, closer or farther away to the sun, and that causes the seasons. It is true that that does have a very small effect of the amount of energy that is received by the Earth, but actually it's completely irrelevant when it comes to the huge swings in the weather, which we call the seasons. So if you ever thought that it had anything to do with the uh, elliptical shape of Earth's orbit and closer and farther away, it's absolutely not really relevant. There's a very small effect, but not much we are going to conquer the topic of how do the seasons work. And in order to do that, we have to actually tackle a few uh, smaller questions. We have to explain how do the four seasons occur in the sequence that they do, spring, summer, uh, fall, and winter, or spring, summer, autumn, and then winter. But also, we wanna talk about and see if we can explain why is it that higher latitudes closer to the poles of the planet are colder anyway. Uh, in fact, you know, Canada, the Arctic Circle, down closer to the southern uh, South Pole, when you get closer to either pole, it naturally gets colder. We wanna explain that as part of this ex as well. In addition, any explanation we have for the seasons, we have to explain the fact that the Northern Hemisphere has exactly the opposite season uh, at the same time of the year to the Southern Hemisphere. So when it's winter in the Northern Hemisphere, it is by definition summer in the Southern Hemisphere and vice versa. And that's true of all four of the seasons. All right, also we wanna talk and explain the idea that when you go and visit uh, the North Pole or the South Pole, then for about half of the year, the sun never appears to set. It's permanently daylight uh, in uh, near the poles of the planet during about half the year. And also the other half of the year, it's permanently darkness. So we wanna explain why is it that the sun never sets for half the year and the sun never rises for the other half of the year. Now, it turns out all of these things are explained by one fact, which is absolutely critical, and that is that the Earth is tilted on its axis. Now, doing all these videos for all these years, it's come to my attention that a great many people out there actually don't believe the Earth is a sphere. Well, let me tell you, the Earth is a sphere, and I challenge you to show me evidence to the contrary that's convincing and believable. It absolutely is, and I can make an entire video series just on that. The seasons are explained by the Earth being a sphere, which is tilted on its orbital axis and also orbiting the sun. So what we're going to do is demonstrate it with a flashlight and a beam of light so you can understand intuitively. We'll do some calculations. We'll explain all of these questions that we brought up in the beginning. So by the end, you will know intimately exactly why the seasons happen on the planet Earth. Now we're all familiar with the seasons, right? We have uh, the beautiful transition where we first we start with spring. That's when things are starting to wake up. The, the, the sun is getting sort of brighter. Things are starting to get warmer. The flowers and the trees are starting to grow their leaves and, and sort of like bud. And then after a period of time, it becomes summer. Summer is when it gets very hot. Often humid comes with the, with the temperature and just gets hotter and hotter and sort of everything is thriving but eventually can get very hot in some places in the summer. Then we start to transition to the colder regions. We call it autumn, or we might also call it fall, depending on where you're from. That's when it starts to get a little cooler, a little more crisp. Uh, the weather starts to change, but it's not frigid yet. It's just starting to have cold snaps. The leaves are starting to turn colors. The leaves are starting to fall off of the trees. And then eventually it reaches what we call winter. Really is when it starts to get very cold consistently, depending on where you live. It might snow or be, have snow or ice on the ground all of the time you know, in, in, in all of these, uh, these kinds of situations. And so even if you just pointed a camera at a tree and took a tree, a picture of a tree every day of the year, you would see it transition from lush green to vivid bright green, uh, meaning the summer. And then of course, getting to autumn where we start turning the colors into the orange and it starts falling off. And then again, into the, uh, into the winter when you start having ice and, and just a lot of, of essentially precipitation in the form of ice that stays on the ground uh, there. All right, well, I do not believe in holding the punchline for the end, so I wanna to get to the reason in the beginning. The reason that we have the seasons is basically completely dependent on the tilt of the Earth. 
The tilt of the Earth is about 23.5 degrees. Actually, it's a little bit less than that, 23.44 degrees, but we round it up to 23 and a half degrees. And when we say the Earth is tilted, what we're talking about is rel relative to its orb, to it, its uh, rotational uh, uh, rotation about the axis. So that's why these globes are always tilted like this. The angle here, if you could draw a line out of the pole, is 23 and a half degrees. And so the Earth is rotating around like this. So if it were, if there were no no tilt at all, the Earth would be straight up and down, just rotating like this, but there is a, uh, a tilt to it. And as the Earth goes around the Sun, that relative tilt is always in place. So as we go around the Sun, sometimes we're tilted towards the Sun, and sometimes we're tilted away from the Sun. This is what gives rise to the reason, uh, what gives rise to the seasons. Of course, we do get a little closer to the Sun and a little farther away from the Sun, but I'm going to show you by calculating here uh, in, in just a few minutes that the effect of being closer and far, farther away only leads to about a 7% difference in the amount of energy received from the Sun. It's not enough by a long shot to explain the drastic range of temperatures that we have due to the seasons. All right, so what I'm going to do is ask you to use your imagination. This, uh, this flashlight here is actually not a flashlight. This is the sun. Now a real sun uh, or a star radiates in all directions as a sphere going all directions. But it's easier for me just to hold this, this directional flashlight, right? So when I shine this thing at the earth, then I need you to imagine that it's the sun shining on the earth, but also radiating in all directions, right? Now to give you a better beam, I'm going to place the flashlight in this tube. So when it exits, I'll just show you on the board here. When it exits and comes out of the tube, you can see a nice spot comes out there. And that just helps us visualize what's going on. So I could shine that spot on the earth and kind of move it around if I wish. What I want to do is I want you to imagine uh, walking on different parts of the planet. And what I want you to do in the beginning is to pretend that the earth isn't even tilted at all. Just e erase the concept of the tilt because we all know that no matter what season of the year it is, it's always warmer near the equator and it gets colder as we approach the North Pole and it also gets colder as we approach the South Pole. So there's something to do with the curvature of the Earth, like not even related to the tilt, that gives rise to this drastic change in temperature as we go near the pole. So let's talk about that. So this is a sphere. It's constantly curved, right? What I'm going to do is ask you to pretend that this piece of cardboard is the local flat surface. So here it's locally flat near the equator. And as we approach, it's it starts to become at an angle of about 45 degrees to, to, to the local horizontal right here as we approach the halfway markup. And then when we get to the pole, it's flat pointed in a 90 degree direction than it did when it was down here. So because the Earth is a sphere, the locally flat surface, I mean, you're walking on this thing facing sideways and, you're, and you would be up here at the pole facing point, pointed up and down and pointed sideways. So you basically have a 90 degree angle between the way in which you point and the, the, earth, the local ground is pointed 90 degrees differently whether you're on the equator or near the pole. Again, forget about the tilt of the Earth for right now. So what I wanted to do is I want to hold this right here and see if I can uh, do it here and show you that if you're someone standing at the equator, again, forget about the tilt of the planet. I'm not even talking about the tilt right now. And if you're the sun, then the energy coming out of this, uh, this cylinder here is the energy flowing out of the sun through a hollow cylinder like this. Now, again, the sun is radiating in all directions, okay? But just consider the energy, the, the, the energy coming and flowing through a cylinder from the sun. As it impacts, the uh, surface of the planet that's near the equator, it would form a spot that would be relatively concentrated because basically the rays coming out of this tube are gonna be hitting 90 degrees there, right? But notice what happens, see if you can still see that. Let me back it up just, just a little bit, see if I can make it a little bit, see if I can, yeah, like that. That's what I'm really wanting you to see. See if I can make it a little bit brighter. Now look what happens as I am now standing somewhere in North America. This, uh, this uh, beam, this spot, it's the same amount of energy hitting the ground here, but as I go towards somewhere uh, in the northern hemisphere, the light is spread out more along the ground because it is hitting a larger amount of the surface. And then as you approach being on the North Pole, you can see it being spread out even more. All right, now we're gonna do the exact same thing from a slightly different uh, angle. We'll do the overhead camera. So when we're hitting the 
equator, the sunlight emerging from the tube in the cylinder is concentrated on a, air, a circle of some uh, surface area here. But as we start walking northward, then it's spread out over a larger surface area. Eventually, when we get to the poles here, if you could see it correctly, in the, hopefully on the overhead camera, you can see that the area over which the same energy is spread out is a much larger surface area. That is what I really want you to get out of it today. That really is the punchline. I have more. Of course, more I want to talk about, more details, of course, but that really is it. And there's a word for this. I want to teach you the word of the day. It's actually one of my favorite words. It's called flux density. You'll sound super smart if you ever throw this out at a party. Flux density. So what do I mean? In specific, we're talking about the power flux density or the energy flux density. You see, the sun is radiating in all directions. All the photons are leaving the sun, and if you were to draw a sphere around the sun at any given point, then all of the energy is flowing through a sphere surrounding the sun. And, and of course, that sphere is getting bigger as the light is traveling farther and farther away. So when I put the tube up, and when I show you the light emerging from the tube and making that spot, there's a certain amount of energy, or power per unit time, power really in watts, flowing through this surface area. But as you walk along the surface of the planet, to higher and higher latitudes, the angle of the ground is changing. And what it means is that same amount of power that is flowing is now spread out of, over a larger and larger area. So what matters for heating the ground and what matters for heating the air is not just the amount of power, it's the amount of power per unit area or the power per area. That's what we call flux density. So when you say something has a high flux density, you mean there's a high amount of whatever it is you're talking about, in this case, power, per unit area, and if there's a low flux density, there's a lower amount of power for every square meter of the ground. That is what heats the ground. That's what heats the air. It's not the total amount of power, it's how concentrated the power is. That's what the flux density is actually doing. So I'm gonna take a few minutes and do a little hypothetical calculation to show you exactly what I mean. So I wanna do a short little calculation. It's extremely easy to understand and it really drives the point home. Let's talk about the uh, situation where the tube, the, the column of sunlight, so to speak, is impinging on the earth, but where the person is basically a little person over here, right, standing on the equator. And so locally, to their, from their point of view, the ground is basically 90 degrees perpendicular to the direction of, of the photons that are coming in and hitting the ground there, right? What does this actually look like? Well, it, remember, it formed a spot along the ground. The sunlight formed a spot, and so it was, one, it was hitting a, the, the surface area, which is in the shape of a circle on the ground. Now, I have to make up some numbers here. The numbers don't actually matter. But let's just pretend that our, in our actual experiment, it was 100 square meters for the circle on the ground. Now, this actual circle spot here was just a few square centimeters. But let's just say it's coming from the sun, and let's say the sun was radiating and it was a one, and the circle on the actual ground of the Earth was 100 square meters, right? What the, the unit that actually matters is actually uh, watts per square meter. That's what actually matters. How many watts are hitting and over what area are they hitting? Now let's pretend that the energy coming out of, out of that tube was 100 watts. Now it wasn't 100 watts. This is not nearly that powerful. I'm just making numbers up. The sun is an enormous powerhouse nuclear fusion, right? It's, it's gigawatts and gigawatts and gigawatts, but the, the actual number doesn't matter. I'm just gonna illustrate a point by pretending the sun, that the energy coming out of this little column was 100 watts, and let's pretend that the spot there, which I can just sort of draw as kind of like an, a, a little circular, you know, sideways little circle there that was basically hitting there, that the area there was 100 square meters, 100 uh, meters squared. So what would be the flux density? This is the number that matters. How much power per how much square meters? 100 divided by 100 is one, and so the answer that you would get would be one watt per square meter. So what this would mean is that if you had, uh, if you consider your tube and you consider the light emerging and that light contained 100 watts of power, right? That's an energy flow per unit time. 
but it was intercepting the ground and hitting a surface area of the ground that was also just happened to be 100 square meters, then when you divide the numbers, you get one watt for every square meter. And that would mean that if you actually went to the ground and had like a power meter and measured every little square meter of the ground, there would be one watt falling on every one of the little square meters on the ground. It would be a flux density, a power hitting the ground over every square meter. That is what locally heats the ground. That is what locally heats the air. Now let's repeat the calculation and do the same sort of thing, except we're going to change it, obviously. So we're going to have our tube right here. We're going to have our little photons coming out. And we're going to have our Earth. I'm going to put E for Earth. Right? Except now our person is no longer going to be uh, here uh, at sort of the equator. They're going to be somebody up here in North America. Uh, locally, the ground is now slanted with respect to how the photons are hitting the ground there. And just exactly as it was uh, in the demonstration, the area over which it's falling locally on the ground is no longer a circle. It's stretched into an ellipse and it's a larger surface area. All right, one more time. Somebody at the equator looks, looks like this. And as we get to somebody in North America, locally the ground is slanted and so it looks more like an oval shape and with a larger surface area on the ground than the person at the pole. And then of course uh, to the equator. And when we get to the pole, the ground is slanted so much, the area of the, the uh, photons hitting the ground is much, much bigger there. So let me put that away. And we're just doing this calculation for giggles, okay? This is not a real calculation but the flux density would basically be equal to the same 100 watts. That's critical because it's still 100 watts coming out of the, of the column of energy that we're measuring, but it's no longer falling over 100 square meters. Because the ground is slanted, let's just pretend that the area is about double, 200 square meters, right? And so what that means in this case is the flux density is what? 100 divided by 200 is one half, and the units are the same, watts per meter squared. Now you know, this is the number that matters, flux density, one half watts per square meter, one watts per square meter. The person in North America, far away from the equator, for every square meter of ground, if they had a, a power meter and they marked off one square meter, they would only measure half a watt hitting every square meter. This is what heats the ground. How much power is hitting over over a given square meter area. And, and of course, as we get toward the pole, the flux density is going down, 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 or the power density is going down, down, down. We'll do one more. Uh, it, it's, a little, it's a little silly, okay, because I don't know what the numbers are, but I'm trying to illustrate the point to you. We'll uh, go and draw the Earth over here. Uh, we have photons coming out. Of course, the sun is huge, so the photons are really coming you know, parallel, essentially, from space. Uh, and we're just considering one little tube. Now, locally, somebody very, let's not say at the North Pole, but let's say somebody very close to the North Pole has a locally very, very flat ground. Not exactly flat. Of course, there is a spot where it's exactly flat, um, but uh, we get close to closer and closer to flat. And we can just see from the demo there that the area over which the energy is hitting the ground is now much, much bigger. The surface area is a very long and stretched out oval uh, there. So the flux density is going to be the exact same 100 watts. But instead of 200 meters, let's just say it's like 300 square meters. And in, in reality, it's probably a lot more like five or 600 square meters in this example. But you, you get the idea. So the flux density is 100 divided by 300, which is one third, and the unit is watt per square meter. So you can see that as you approach the poles, only because, I'm not even talking about the tilt yet, okay? I'll get to the tilt in just a second, because it essentially amplifies this effect. But even if the Earth wasn't tilted at all, if it was just a ball straight up and down and rotating without any tilt at all, it would still be colder at the poles for every day of the year than it is at the equator. Because everyone standing at the equator is gonna have a high flux power density, someone standing halfway to the pole is gonna have a lower flux density, and someone standing very, very close to the pole will have a much, much lower flux density. And this has nothing to do with the power coming from the sun, it's constant 100 watts, for every, in my example, through the tube, but the ground is sloping differently. So the angle of the photons is much shallower, and so each photon, remember, Waves of light are really packets of photons. And so if you spread them out over a very, very large area, then locally they're, they're heating the ground, but over a much larger area. And so 
ultimately you're not getting as much total heating that's basically soaking into the ground, which drives all the weather patterns, right? The heating of the air, uh, convection, and all of that. That really is the basic idea behind everything uh, that I really, really, really want to talk about here. Uh, if you get this, you understand the entire concept. Now, I mentioned earlier that if you ask most people, why do the seasons happen, they'll probably tell you it has something to do with the distance from the Earth to the sun. There's a very minor effect there. It doesn't really affect much of anything. It's almost all due to the tilt and the relative, the tilt of the angle there uh, of the Earth's rotation to the direction of the orbit of the, of, the, of the Earth around the sun. All right. In fact, here's a fun fact that'll blow your mind. Actually, in the dead of winter time, when it's frigid in the northern hemisphere, I'm, I'm in the northern hemisphere, so forgive me if you're in the southern hemisphere watching this. Think about me being in the northern hemisphere. In the dead of winter, sometime in January, okay, we're actually closer to the sun during the dead of winter than during the hottest part of the summer. In the hottest part of the summer, we're actually farther away. That is absolutely backwards as to what you might think. It's so important, actually. I'm going to draw a little figure to show you exactly what I'm talking about. Let's say that we have the sun here in the center, right? And we have the... Uh, Earth going around. What I'm basically saying here, and I have to draw it sort of trying to trying to draw it as a uh, uh, an ellipse here, uh, but it's it's not going to be. I'm going to exaggerate it for effect, right? So this is the Earth, right, on one side, and what I'm saying is that the Earth goes around in an ellipse. Sometimes it's farther away, and sometimes it's closer, right? Now this is a perspective drawing, so you have to think of it actually being a, a, an elliptical egg shape there, uh, here. Well, actually. If I label this, let's call it January uh, 3rd, let's call it, right? Um, and what would the distance be? How far and close do, uh, is the actual sun and the earth uh, at different parts of the year? Well, the distance, right, uh, during this time of the year, when we actually in the northern hemisphere are experiencing winter, is about 147 million kilometers. So the M means million, million kilometers, okay? Now let's go to the other side of the orbit. Now, I've already given you the punchline. Let's draw another Earth right here. Now this is greatly exaggerated. And what would the date be over here? The other side of the orbit, let's call it July 3rd. This is the very hottest part of the summer in terms of the Northern Hemisphere, all right? And what is the distance during uh, this part of the orbit from uh, the Earth to the Sun? It's about 152 million kilometers. I want you to stare at that and let it sink in. What we're saying is that when we're experiencing the hottest part of the summer, we're actually farther away in the northern hemisphere. The Earth is farther away during the hottest part of the summer than during the dead of winter when we're actually closest to the sun. So that right there just annihilates any effect uh, that, that the distance from the Earth to the sun has on the seasons. Because what we consider to be, uh, now of course the distance away from the from the and Earth and the sun, it does affect how much heat is hitting the ground. But the seasonal variation of the seasons being coldest in the winter months of January and February in the Northern Hemisphere and hottest in July and August in the Northern Hemisphere has no correlation to how far away we are. In fact, it's absolutely backwards. So just to kind of continue filling this out, you know, somewhere over here, this will be like, let's call it December 21st, right? Uh, over here, we'll call over here, this is the Earth, uh, September 23rd, right? Over here, we'll draw another Earth, and this will be June. You'll see these dates uh, have significance in a minute. I'm going to show you another diagram to show you why these are important dates, but you get the idea. And here's another Earth, and then this one is March 21st. So you see the, the spring is starting to happen kind of over here, right? And then we get into sort of the warming up and we get into the hottest part of the summer and then we start getting into the fall and then we start getting into the winter. But during the part of the year when we start getting into the winter, we're actually closer to the sun than when we're uh, farther away. It's starting to basically get very hot and warm up there. So we need to be able to explain that, right? So the closest that we get is 147 million kilometers. The farthest we get is 152 million kilometers. So it is true that the orbit of the Earth, just like all the planets, are ellipses. We have a, a, a closest po uh, point of approach and we have a farthest point of approach. However, the numbers are very close to each other. 147 million compared to 152 million. They're pretty close. I mean, it is elliptical, but it's very close to being circular. 
All right. So what we'll do, actually, if you stick around to the very end of this, is I'm going to calculate for you and show you. I told you there was about a seven percent, um, uh, seven percent difference in heat received from the sun, depending on if you're here or here, just based on the distance, not nothing to do with the tilt. I'm going to do that calculation for you and show you how we do it. I think it's a fun, easy calculation, and it shows you why it only gives you about seven percent. Uh, a difference in energy received based on the distance there. It's all governed by the tilt. And the d example that I gave you where you tilt 45 degrees and you see the light spread apart, spread along that much larger area, giving you a lower flux density and lower and lower and lower flux density as you approach the poles. That's what's governing the seasons. All right. So what is governing the seasons? Well, you have this thing called the tilt of the planet, right? We all know what it is. I'll get my little globe here in a second. But let's say you're traveling in the orbit uh, this way. The Earth is traveling this way through space along its orbit, let's say. And so you have some Earth. We'll just draw it as a sphere. It's not a perfect sphere, right? If there was no tilt, then the Earth would just, the axis would be some, you know, right here. Uh, there, and it would just be going around and around like this. However, when we actually look and see how the Earth is, is, is actually, I'll go down here, I'll put a little right angle right there, then actually, I guess I'll, I'll do it in red, there is a tilt right here where the Earth is rotating, not about the up and down axis where it's uh, perpendicular to the direction of the, of, the or of the motion of the planet, but it's tilted off to the side and rotating like that. Now let me go get my globe and kind of illustrate what that means. When we talk about the Earth being tilted, if there was no tilt at all, then you see how it would be straight up and down and the Earth would be going like this through space, right? Then it'd be rotating like this and traveling through space like this. However, the Earth is actually uh, tilted at an angle here, and this angle is 23.44 degrees, which is very close to 23.5 degrees. That's usually the uh, the, uh, the angle that we tell school children and things like this. And this is the angle between the rotation axis of the planet and the straight up and down direction compared to the orbital motion there. That's what it is. So it's basically the angle between this marker and then this marker right here, this angle there, but 23 and a half degrees. Now, most people think that when the Earth orbits the sun, that it's kind of like changing orientation or something like this. Now, actually, the, the, uh, uh, the spin axis never moves as we go around the planet. Notice how my finger is pointed in the same direction. I guess maybe I'll get this to show you. It's like this. As the Earth orbits the sun, the direction of the spin axis of the planet doesn't change. So if you can imagine the sun being in the center, then on some parts of the orbit, we're going to be pointed towards the sun. And as we get on the other side, if the Earth, if the sun is in the center, again, we'll be pointed away. So even without any tilt, I already showed you that just walking towards the North Pole changes how much power density you're getting. But because you add this tilt on top of it, you greatly amplify the effect. In the times of the year when the Earth is pointed towards the sun, then everybody in the northern hemisphere is getting a higher flux density because they're tilted towards the sun and the sunlight is hitting more directly, right? But there are times of the year when if you're uh, when you're uh, uh, tilted away from the sun in the northern hemisphere, and just like we showed with the paper before, you're spreading out the sunlight even more than it normally is there. And I have a handy dandy drawing here that I want to to basically show you. Let me get all my little talking points here so I can make sure I say everything. All right. We have, uh, what we want to do is we want to walk through this picture because you see these kinds of pictures and I want to walk through it with you. We have the four seasons labeled. We have winter, summer, autumn, and uh, spring or winter, autumn, summer, spring like this. So let's start at the beginning of the year. Essentially, the end of the year is December. Uh, that's when it's very cold and the spin axis of the Earth is oriented away from the sun, which is in the center, right? But then as the, again, you have to imagine like my fist being the sun. When you get over here, as it is in the diagram on this side, the far side here, then what you have is there is a tilt of the earth, but but the sunlight is, isn't really affected so much by the, you're not tilted toward or away when the sun is here. The sunlight is just hitting the, the side sort of of the globe over here. But then when the sun gets over here, then you're tilted towards the, uh, the sun. And so you're getting more direct sunlight over here. And then when you get on the backside over here, it's the same as what happened over there. You're tilted uh, in one direction or another, but you're not tilted towards or away. 
All right? So that's what these special dates are basically for. This is the first day of winter. And the first day of winter is defined as being when the Earth reaches the point in its orbit where you have maximum tilt away from the sun. Remember, when you're tilted away from the sun, then all of the sun's rays are going to be spread out over a different area, the same as I showed you uh, over there. In fact, we can kind of do that thought experiment again. If you are over here in the winter, if you live, let's say, right here, then compared to the summer, then you're actually getting a much shallower angle here, because at the other side of the planet, uh, over here, then during the daytime, you see the angle is actually much steeper and tilted more towards the sun. See, the orientation of the Earth on different sides of the orbit hasn't changed. It's just that when you get into the daylight, remember daylight, the sun is over here, so this is the daylight side, then it's very shallow because the Earth is tilted away. And so you have a very low flux density of the sunlight. But when you get over here, again, the daylight is on this side, you see how the angle of this thing, even during the day, is much steeper. That means it's going to make a more concentrated uh, uh, a circle with a higher flux density. And then when you're in between the winter and the summer, then you have these, what we call summer and, uh, uh, I should say, we have spring and, uh, spring and fall. Then what you have here is the sun hitting, I guess I'll do it this way to you, pretend you're the sun. The sun, uh, you are basically are a sphere and you're not tilted towards or away. It would be like you are the sun. And yes, you have colder areas down up here and you have colder areas down here, but you're not tilted towards or away during the middle of the year. In the autumn or in the spring, the sun is just equally illuminating the northern and the southern hemisphere. You're not uh, tilted towards or away. So the, the autumn or the spring are sort of the in-between points of winter and summer because those are the points exactly halfway when you're not tilted directly towards or away. Now, we have some dates here. Keep, keep those dates in mind. We have another diagram. This is almost exactly the same diagram. The only thing that has been added are these fancy words called equinox and solstice. These are super fancy sounding words, but I want you to think of the word equinox. I want you to think of it as sounding like equals. So when you think equal sign or the word equation, the word equal is in there. It means two things are the same. So when you have equinox, you need to be thinking equal light. That's what it basically means. Equal. Something's equal. What is equal during the equinox? Well, it's the two points in the orbit where the uh, in-between tilting away and tilting toward the sun. When you're here in the northern and southern hemisphere are getting the same amount of light. You're not tilted towards or away in March. You're not tilted towards or away in September because you're on the part of the orbit where both the northern and the southern hemisphere are getting the same amount of light because you're not tilted towards or away. So we call that the uh, spring equinox or the fall or autumn equinox. And these are the dates that, that uh, during the year when that happened. Now, it depends on who you consult as to the exact date, because remember, we have time zones. So uh, in the previous drawing, for instance, notice it gave a range of dates for the, uh, for the equinoxes, right? And in this drawing, it just picked a date, it, because it depends on where you live, if it's March 21st or March 22nd or whatever. But you get the point. The point isn't the date. The point is that there is a point in the orbit where the northern and the southern hemisphere are getting the same amount of light. It's called an equinox, and it happens twice per orbit, once on this side, once on this side. Once when you're approaching the warmer parts of the year, and once when you're approaching the colder parts of the year. So that's what an equinox is, equal light, okay? Now we have something called a solstice. And anytime you see the word solstice, you need to be thinking that is either a point of maximum solar radiation or energy or minimum, maximum or minimum solar energy. So solstice, you need to be thinking either max or min sunlight. And so you have a winter solstice. This is when the Earth is in the part of its orbit where it's, notice its tilt has the same ori orientation all the way around, but we are maximally tilted away and that's called the winter solstice. Here we have the summer solstice, June 21st, where we're maximally tilted towards the sun. And so, just like our demonstration, we're gonna do it one more time, as we go around the planet, we get, just because of the tilt of the planet, we get more or less flux density, just because of the orientation of the planet. All right, so let's start off in the winter time. We are tilted away, and that means that anybody standing on the northern hemisphere is sort of laying back, and the angle of the ground, you can see the angle of the ground here, is going to be a lot sh more shallow 
anytime you're in the northern hemisphere there. So the light is going to be hitting at a very uh, shallow angle here, and I'll turn it toward the camera so you can see what it looks like. And you see that the incident light is not forming a, sol a, a, a circle like at the, at the equator, it's spread out there. And so everybody in the northern hemisphere would be receiving uh, less flux density, and so it's going to be very cold. Now, the people in the southern hemisphere are pointed towards and tilted towards the sun. It has nothing to do with the distance being closer or farther away. It's just the angle. So the people here, you can see the angle of the people down here. This is very steep, whereas the people in the northern hemisphere, it's very, very shallow. So very, very steep uh, pointed toward the sun, and so it's going to look more like this. It's going to be a very high flux density. The people in the southern hemisphere would see something like this, but the people in the northern hemisphere would see something a lot more shallow, a lot less heating per unit area. So that's why it's winter in the northern hemisphere, and it is summer in the southern hemisphere, right? Like this. Now let's go all the way around to the other side of the planet. In June, June 21st, we get to the summer solstice. Now the northern hemisphere is actually pointed towards the sun, and the local ground has a very high angle. The sun is very high in the sky. So in the northern hemisphere, it's going to be a very high angle, and again, the flux density will be high to look uh, like the power energy coming in will be falling close to a circular shape on the ground. Very high flux density, so that's why it is uh, very hot in the summertime there. But the people in the southern hemisphere are getting a very shallow angle. Look how shallow that angle is uh, to the sun there. And so the people in the southern hemisphere are getting very spread out sunlight. So this explains exactly why the people in the northern hemisphere are experiencing summer. And at the same time, the people in the southern hemisphere are experiencing winter. I have come across so many people, I don't know if they're trolling me, telling me that the Earth is flat. Explain this in terms of an Earth flat. It's just ridiculous. We have spacecraft that go out and take pictures of our planet. We know it's a sphere, all right? But there are a lot of people that are willfully ignorant of, of logic and facts. This perfectly explains why the northern and the southern hemisphere experience exact opposite seasons. And it also explains the following. These are the extremes, the sol summer solstice and the winter solstice. But let's go halfway in the orbit. If the Earth is really a sphere, and if it really is tilted, then there should be a point in the orbit where it's neither tilted towards nor away from the sun. And just to kind of illustrate it, here is the wintertime in the northern hemisphere tilted away. Here's the summertime in the northern hemisphere tilted towards. But when we get in the middle, if the sun is on the board there, then neither the, the northern nor the southern hemisphere, if you look at where I'm aiming my light, is tilted towards or away from the sun. They're getting equal sunlight in that case. So this is the picture you have to burn in your head. When we're tilted away in the northern hemisphere, we have a shallow angle, low flux density, gets very cold, right? The other side of the planet, when we're tilted towards the uh, uh, sun, we have a very high flux density. The angle is high, the sun is very high in the sky, and we have direct sunlight hitting with a high flux density. We get very, very warm in the uh, northern hemisphere, and exactly the opposite in the southern hemisphere. In between these two extremes, which we call the solstice, at exactly the midpoint, we have equal amount of light hitting northern and southern hemisphere on both sides, and those are just marking the transition point when we start to go around to the other side of the orbit. The weather starts changing. That's why during fall, things start changing to get colder. And in the spring, things start changing. Things start changing to get warmer. Now, there's one final thing that I really wanted to talk about before I do the final calculation. And that is the phenomena that if you actually lived at the North Pole of the planet, there would be periods of time when the sun would never go down below the horizon, never set. And there would be periods of time where the sun would never rise. So if you actually had a house at the North Pole, then literally for six months of the year, it would be complete darkness. The nighttime would never go away. And then there would also be six months of the year where it's daylight all the time for six months, and the sun would just do a little circle in the sky, but it would never go below the horizon. We want to explain that, again, in terms of our spherical Earth and the tilt here. So that's what we're going to do right now. All right, let's take the situation in the dead of winter, in the northern hemisphere, when the angle of the Earth is tilted away maximally from the Sun. So we're going to keep that orientation where the angle of the Earth is like this, and this is the orientation that we have right here. This is the spin axis of the Earth, and the Sun is off this direction. So let me turn my light on, like this. So I'm illuminating the Earth, right? It's not a perfect illumination. If you live right here, or, or very close, look at my finger. As my finger is tracing the around uh, here, what's going to happen is, even when I get way over here, closest to the sun, 
right, physically, I'm not gonna be illuminated. See, that would be illumination of my finger. But because the sun is over here, and it's very far away, but it's illuminated over here, I'm permanently shadowed over here, and basically from my vantage point up here, I, I would have to look through the earth to basically see the sun. The sun's very far away, but I would never really see it, even when I'm physically closest through the rotation. As the earth continues to rotate, then it's going to be uh, uh, for one 24 hour rotation, even when I get on the backside, I'm definitely not gonna see the planet, because the, the sun, because I'd have to look through the planet. But even when I got around over here, physically closest to the sun, I would still not see, I mean, the, 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 the sun, the day dark uh, terminator is gonna be over, up here uh, somewhere. And in fact, that has a name. It's called the Arctic Circle. If you look down here, there's something called the Arctic Circle, which is a circle right here. Anything inside of that Arctic Circle is going to experiencing is going to experience six months of darkness, uh, and then in the other half of the year, six months of daylight. So anything inside of the Arctic Circle, that's why we have a label for it, is going to experience the permanent daylight darkness for six months of the year. And anything outside of the Arctic Circle, like if I put my finger over here, at like a kind of Alaska, and then if I can do it right, and, and then kind of like have the Earth orbit, then when I get over here, I'm gonna start to see a sunrise eventually. But what's gonna end up happening is eventually Alaska is gonna retreat and I'm gonna have darkness again over here. But that's only because I'm outside of the Arctic Circle over here. If I'm inside the Arctic Circle, I'm never going to see the sun because I have to sort of look through the earth down in order to see it. That's what's happening over here. I get six months of darkness for half the year. As the earth gets over here though, then the situation changes. So let's look at what happens whenever we are in the summer solstice, we're pointed towards the sun. So in order to do that, I'm basically going to have to uh, put the sun on the other side, essentially. So what was originally, this, it was over here, and then as we orbit and get on the other side of the planet, then now the sun is coming from this direction, right? So I guess you could kind of like pick this up, and you could say, okay, I'll, I'm going to go over here like this, and so now I'm just going to put it back down on my shelf here. So the tilt of the Earth has not really changed uh, relatively, and now you can see I'm, point, I'm tilted now towards the sun as I am over here. Now what's going to happen is... Uh, as I, uh, as I look inside of the Arctic Circle, then the sun is never going to set, right? Because I'm always illuminating, no matter, even if I'm on the back, like if I'm over here in the daylight, of course I'm gonna see the sun. But as the earth rotates, even when I get far away over here, I can still see the sun because I'm tilted towards the sun. So the sun is just gonna make little circles in the sky from my point of view, which is kinda hang there close to the horizon. I'll have to look down close to the horizon. It's gonna be hanging out close to the horizon, but it will always be above the ground again for six months of the year. And the exact opposite is happening on the other side. When I am seeing sunlight all the time, the Southern Hemisphere is seeing darkness all the time and vice versa. And that happens for six months of the year. So that explains why inside of the Arctic Circle, we have those perpetual, uh, it's called the midnight sun, where the sun is just up like all the time, again for six months of the year. Now, I wanna close the lesson with a discussing, going back to the beginning, discussing the common reason why people give for the seasons. Most people will answer that because the Earth goes in an orbit, sometimes we're closer, sometimes we're farther away, or maybe they think it's the tilt of the Earth and it's because we're tilted closer, we're a tiny bit closer, and then sometimes we're a tiny bit farther away. It has nothing to do with the distance. It's just the angle, as I've mentioned about 10 times. But I wanna do a little calculation. We know from this diagram that the Earth, during the closest point of the orbit, is 147 million kilometers away, and roughly, and and we know that the farthest distance is about 152 million kilometers away. So I want to calculate how much power is intercepted by the entire Earth when it's at its closest approach. And I want to figure out how much energy is intercepted or power intercepted by the planet when it is in its farthest point away. And we're going to compare those two numbers. And we're going to find out, I'll give you the punchline, that there's only about a 7% difference whether you're in the closest point of the orbit to the farthest point of the orbit away. And if you're just considering the tilt of the Earth being closer and farther away, it's even less because the whole diameter of the Earth is just not very big compared to the orbit of it. So if, if the orbit of the Earth doesn't really affect the seasons, and certainly the, the tilt being the distance uh, towards or away is not going to affect it at all. It's only to do with the angle and spreading the energy out over the ground. That's what the actual reason is. So let me draw a little picture, and then we're going to do that calculation. 
All right, so we have something called the sun, and we have two points we want to consider, and it's a little bit weird the way I'm going to draw it, so you're going to have to forgive me, but basically I'm going to draw sort of two orbits. I'm going to pretend they're sort of two different Earths in two different situations. The first Earth I'm going to put right here, and it's some distance away I'm going to call R sub C because it's the closest distance, and that's 147, and that's million kilometers. Right? But then we have another part of the, uh, when the Earth gets farther away, I'm going to draw it down here, and so the distance here, I'm going to call it RF, because it's the farther, the, the farthest distance the Earth gets away, and this is 152 million kilometers. All right? And what we want to do is want to calculate how much power is intercepted when the Earth is close, and how much is intercepted when it's far away. Now you have to use your imagination here. I don't have a star in, 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 my, in my room here. But the sun is a fusion furnace that's spewing out energy in all directions. And if you put a shell, an invisible shell around the sun, a three-dimensional spherical shell, then all of the power emanating from the sun will cut through any shell that you draw. So if the earth is at a certain distance away then, uh, from the sun, then the earth has a cross-sectional area. It's really a sphere, but from a cross-section point of view, from you looking at it, it looks like a circle. A circle with some area to it, okay? Whether or not the earth is far away or not, it still has some cross-sectional area. But when it's close to the sun, it's intercepting more power because the sphere surrounding the sun when the earth is closer is sm a smaller sphere. Uh, like this sphere right here. So the proportion of how much the Earth intercepts when it's closer uh, to the Sun is, is uh, higher, or the ratio is higher, than when the Earth is farther away, because the circle is bigger. And the power flow from the Sun stays constant, roughly speaking. It's not really constant, but it, we just say it's constant here. So what I want to do is calculate the difference in the power received when the Earth is close to when the power is far away. Now I'm not going to use real numbers because we're not going to need to, we're just going to use little estimates. So when the Earth is close to the Sun, and we know it's 147 million miles away, how much power does the Earth actually get? How much power does the uh, Earth receive? Well, what we, we know is that there is some cross-sectional area of the planet Earth, we're going to call that the area of the cross-sectional area, A sub X. That's the cross-sectional area of the Earth. We could calculate it. We know what the area of a circle is. We know the radius of the Earth. We could calculate it and get a number in like square kilometers. But we don't need to do that. Let's just say that it's some area, some cross-sectional area of the Earth. We don't need to know what it is right now. We'll just put it there. And we'll take the ratio of that to a sphere when the Earth is this far away. Now the surface area of sphere is 4 times pi times R squared. And so I'm going to call it R sub C squared. So what I'm doing is I'm saying when the Earth is, is in, a, in the closest point of its orbit, if we imagine a sphere, a constant distance all the way around, that sphere would have some area, 4 pi R squared. But the Earth would be a very small part of that surface area of a sphere, its cross-sectional area. We call it A sub X. I don't need to know what these numbers are. I'm just writing them down and saying that the ratio of the area of the Earth to the ratio of a sphere at this distance away is given by this ratio. Now if I take that ratio and multiply it by the power in, that the Sun provides in the universe, the, in other words, if I could, if I knew an accurate, and you could look it up, but we don't need to know it, the power in gigawatts, or there's a bigger unit than that, the Sun is, is an enormous supply of power, right? But it's a very big number. The power emanating from the Sun is a number in watts. If we take that power emanating from the Sun and multiply it by the ratio of the area of the Earth divided by the area of a sphere at that distance away, the close distance away, this is going to be a ratio how much is intercepted by the whole planet divided by the entire sphere at that distance away, multiplied by the total power of the sun times this ratio, that's going to tell me how much power the Earth is intercepting when the Earth is at its closest point. Right? Now, we do the exact same thing when it's far away. When it's far away, we have a similar thing. We have a cross-sectional area of the Earth uh, compared to a ratio 4 pi r squared. But now it's farther away, so I'm going to call it the far distance rf. And that's, again, squared. And again, that's going to be multiplied by the power of the Sun. So all I'm doing here is I'm saying when the Earth is the farthest point in its orbit away, we just take the power that the Sun is emanating in all directions, and we multiply it by a ratio. This ratio is just the cross-sectional area of the Earth, which is just literally the area in square meters that the Earth sees from the Sun's point of view in terms of a circle, its cross-sectional area, divided by the area of the sphere 
This is a ratio of how much kind of energy is intercepted by the Earth compared to the total sphere's surface area at that distance, but then we multiply by the power of the sun. So whatever these numbers are, I could substitute in and I would calculate how much energy or power is intercepted by the Earth when it's close and by the, uh, how much the energy the Earth is, is receiving when it's far away. And notice that this is an area and this is an area. So when you divide them, this has no units at all, at all. And when you multiply by watts, then what you would get is a number of watts that the entire planet is uh, receiving when it's far away, and this would be the entire number of watts the planet is receiving when it's close. Now, since we want to compare these two, we want to just take the ratio of the power when it's close divided by the power when it's far away. So this ratio, because we're going to compare these two, is going to be equal to this thing divided by this thing. That's really all it is. So I'm just going to repeat it, a sub x over 4 pi r sub c squared multiply by the power in, uh, uh, that the sun is spewing out, and we're going to divide that by the power received when the Earth is far away. A sub x, 4 pi r f, whoops, capital F, squared, times p sub sun. Now let's see what this ratio is, because what we're trying to do is see how much energy does the Earth actually receive when it's close, compared to how much energy does the Earth power does the Earth receive? I, I keep throwing the words power and energy in uh, interchangeably, and I'm sorry about that. Energy is in joules, watts is joules per second. And the sun is always shining, so really it's better to talk about power, how many uh, joules per second, that's, that's what we call a watt. So uh, forgive me if I use energy and power interchangeably. Energy is uh, energy, we'll talk, have that in a separate lesson, but power is, the f is how many joules per second, the energy per unit time. And we have a word for that, we call it a watt. So this is how many watts the Earth is receiving when it's close, and this is how many watts the Earth is receiving when it's far away. But we see that the power of the sun is in the numerator and the denominator, so we can just cancel that straight out. And then we can simplify over here. We can have a, this is a fraction divided by a fraction, so we have ax over 4 pi r sub c squared. We turn the fraction division into multiplication, so we flip and multiply, so it'll be 4 pi r f squared over, we flip and multiply, so ax on the bottom. And you should remember from uh, basic algebra that when we have terms in the top and the bottom, since it's all multiplied, we can, these divide away and they give us one, or you might say they cancel. The four divided by the four cancels and just gives us the one. The pi divided by the pi cancels and gives us one. So this ratio that we wanted to calculate that compares the uh, power received at the two points in the orbit is just gonna be r sub f squared divided by r sub c squared. In other words, it depends on how close we are in the two points in the orbit, but not just their distance. Their distance is squared. The reason they're squared is because this is an energy flow per area. I told you it was the flux density that matters. So the area of the spheres is what's gonna matter, not just the distance from the sun. And so we know that the farthest away the sun is, according to these round numbers, is 152. And really it's 152 million kilometers, but uh, the, we could just round it into other units, and we could say 152 squared. In other words, I could put 152 million and square that and get a giant number, and then do the same thing, get a giant number, but the zeros are all going to cancel, so it's, it's not going to much matter, or it won't matter at all, 147 squared on the bottom. If you do the, if you do it, since we're dividing the numbers, if you do 152 or 152 million, uh, and 147 or 147 million and square them, you're going to get exactly the same ratio. On the top, when you take 152 and you square it, you get 23104, 23,104, and here you get 21609. And so that ratio, when you take 23104 and you divide by 21609, you get 1.069. And so when you divide by, when you strip away the 1 and you multiply by 100 to turn it into a percentage, you get 6.9%, which we can round to 7%. What this number is telling us is that when we're close to the sun, we're getting 7% more energy than when we're far away. I may have misspoke earlier because it looks, it looks like you're comparing far compared to close, but the original calculation, this right here, notice this was r sub c. So this numerator is close. This is the distance when we're close, and this denominator is far. So the original calculation is taking how much energy we get when we're close to the sun, dividing with how much energy we get when we're far away from the sun. This does show up, but that's just the way the math works out. The actual number that we get is 7% more, meaning that when we're close to the planet, we're getting 7% more, or 1.069, 
more energy than when we're far away. And you already know that the temperature swings from winter to summer is nowhere near 7%. I mean, in the summertime, you know, things are not freezing usually in, the, in a normal, you know, uh, city in the Northern Hemisphere. In the summer, things are generally not frigid and frozen. But then in the wintertime, you're getting very, very cold. Now, weather dynamics on the planet have a lot to do with this. And there's weather patterns and there's, there's fronts and there's all kinds of things. But all of the energy for the weather comes from the sun. Ultimately, it comes from the sun. So it, you could, to a first approximation, you can say that the temperature swing should be related to how much energy is being received. There could be a, a delay because it takes time to heat the ground and, and so on. But that is uh, the answer to the question. And not only that, but we are the closest to the sun in January. All right, whenever it's, when it's frigid and we're farther uh, away when it's really, really hot. But even if you uh, said there was maybe some time delay involved here and, and really that, that, that doesn't make so much sense, you just look at the numbers close compared to far away, you would still find out that the energy intercepted is only about 7% difference. And that's just not enough to account for the, uh, for the uh, uh, seasons. So in summary, we're gonna go back to my main uh, list of questions I wanted to answer. The first question I said is I want to explain why is it colder in the northern latitudes as we get closer to the pole. And we illustrated that with the piece of paper. Even if there's no tilt, if you shine a light and you're near the equator, it's concentrated over a smaller area, high flux density. As you walk towards the North Pole, the ground gets more shallow compared to the light source. Same number of watts, but a bigger area. It's spread out. The power density is lower, the flux density is lower, and so that means that the ground is heated less per square meter. So that's why it's colder as you get towards the pole. The second question was talking about why do we have four distinct seasons? Why do we have a spring, a summer, uh, a winter, and an autumn? And we explain that by saying that uh, we have one part of the orbit, we are tilted maximally far away, right? We have words for that. We call that a winter solstice when we're tilted maximally far away. The flux density in the northern hemisphere is lowest because the energy is spread out over a bigger area because the ground is very shallow compared to the incoming solar radiation. And then we have the other side of the planet where we're tilted towards and the angle is actually the highest uh, at a given point. And so we have uh, uh, another what we call solstice and the flux density is higher. The heating of the ground would be higher here. And we have the exact opposite happening in the southern hem hemisphere. But between these points in the orbit, we have the sunlight hitting north and southern hemisphere identically. And so we have those, uh, what we call the in-between marks, we have the uh, other seasons that we have, the autumn, and we have the spring is what we call it. And these were called equinoxes. So the word equinox means equal light, right, sort of. And the word solstice means maximum or minimum solar energy, tilted towards or away. That was question number two. That explains why we have the four seasons. The third question we said is we wanted to explain why the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere are exactly opposite of each other with, re uh, with uh, respect to the seasons. Because when the northern hemisphere is tilted away, the southern hemisphere must be tilted towards. And when the northern hemisphere is tilted towards, the southern hemisphere must be tilted uh, away. That's why winter and summer are exactly opposite in the northern southern hemisphere and, and, and similar as we travel throughout the orbit. And the last question we wanted to talk about was why at the northern pole and the southern pole do we have half of the year of day where we have daylight happening for six months and the sun never sets and we have uh, darkness for six months where the sun never rises. And that's just because when we're tilted and the way the sun is coming in half of the year, even as the earth rotates, we're constantly bathed in sunlight because we're tilted towards the sun. But if we're on the other side, tilted away from the sun, like over here, if we're over here, even as we, if you can imagine yourself uh, over here, just kind of going in a circle, there is a point uh, closest to the pole where you're never going to see the sun because you have to look through the planet to see it. That would be six months of darkness. This would be six months of daylight because even as you rotate uh, here, you're always going to be bathed in sunlight. All right. You'd be surprised how many people, uh, including me, of course, before, you know, I learned this stuff, uh, just don't know why we have uh, the seasons. Most people will say it's because we're closer or farther in our orbit. And that's as we said, as we showed, 
about a 7% difference. But not only that, the dates don't even work at all. So that doesn't make any sense. And then if they, if most people don't tell you that, they'll tell you, oh, it's because of the tilt, but it's because we're tilted. And so we're closer during, like physically closer here than uh, we are over here, physically farther away. That's a negligible effect because even if you are tilted towards or away, you, you cannot get more than one Earth diameter away or toward the sun. And we already showed that even throughout its orbit, it only uh, accounts for 7% of the energy difference. So being tilted award or towards or away, uh, less than one Earth diameter, the distance involved in the tilt has absolutely no effect on the seasons at all. It is 100% because when you have the ground and you have the light and it's at a 90 degree angle, the concentration of the sunlight is high, but as the tilt of the earth is happening as we go around the sun, then the ground is tilted with respect to the light and the sunlight is spread out. That is the reason why we have the seasons. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.